Good afternoon. My name is John Strope. I'd like to welcome you to the Nebraska State Historical Society's Brown Bag History Lecture Series. The brown bags have been offered since the 1980s. With a couple of exceptions some years ago, the brown bag topics for a year are not thematic. However, in light of Nebraska's 150th celebration of statehood, the Society is sponsoring brown bags for 2017 related to the theme of peoples of Nebraska. Lectures are held monthly on the third Thursday in the auditorium at the Nebraska History Museum at 15th and P Street in Lincoln. The programs have a live audience, are broadcast on public access channels in Lincoln, Omaha, Bellevue, Hastings, North Platte, Grand Island, Papillion, South Sioux City, Blair, Bassett, Shadron, Sydney, and Beatrice, and are posted on YouTube. A detailed schedule for this series, as well as information about all of the Society's programs and services, can be found on the Society's website. If you are not already a member, I encourage you to join. Benefits of membership include subscriptions to Nebraska History Magazine and the Society's newsletter. Use of a microfilm reader printer in the Society's library archives to make free copies from microfilm free admission to the Society's seven historic sites, discounts in the Society's landmark stores at the History Museum, the State Capitol, and Chimney Rock, and reduced fees for kids' classes, tours, after-hours events, and similar activities where there is a fee. Before I introduce today's speaker, I want to thank the Nebraska State Historical Society Foundation for the financial support which allows us to tape and broadcast programs on public access television across the state and on the Society's YouTube page. By the way, for those of you in the audience, there's a new envelope with a flyer in it from the foundation back on the table there. To find these videos on YouTube, directions um, are here on the video. Uh, you can see them on the screen. It's easy. Type in your browser www.youtube.com slash user slash Nebraska Historical. Click on playlists and you will go to a new page. There you will see a list labeled 2017. 2017, a subsection to house this special sesquicentennial brown bag series, The Peoples of Nebraska. Just below that subsection, you will see a subsection labeled Brown Bag Lectures, where you will find over 150 other past brown bags available on YouTube. Our speaker today is Jim McKee. The topic is well-known Nebraskans you may have never heard of. It is trite to say about someone, he needs no introduction. But if that is true about anyone giving the Historical Society's brown bag history talk, it is 100% true about Jim McKee. He is the historian of Lincoln and of Nebraska. A graduate of dear old NU and a sharer of history for decades, he occupies some of his work hours as owner of Lee Booksellers and the Coinery. As to asking question, Jim says, ask that question anytime you want. Please join me in welcoming Jim McKee. <laughs> Being the sesquicentennial, John asked me to talk about 150 Nebraskans that you may never have known. Well, there may have been 150. Some of the people that we'll talk about today you probably will recognize. Uh, a lot of them you won't recognize, and surely if you would go around the state, these names will mean very little to a lot of people. 
Uh, so we're looking at not 150, but probably someplace more like 10, 12, 15 or so, depending on how time works out. Uh, the first one is a man named Charlie Taylor, uh, probably a name which doesn't resonate with you, but would resonate with a large segment of the United States, uh, and certainly those people who are interested in aviation. Uh, Charlie Taylor, Charles Taylor, was born in Cerro Gordo, Illinois in 1868. So right after the Civil War, uh, his father, William Stephen Taylor, they moved to Lincoln in 1878. Uh, Lincoln at that time had a population of about 13,700, so it was still very early uh, in the city's history. Uh, in 1880, at age 12, he left school and we went to work for the Nebraska State Journal, which will morph into the Lincoln Journal and the Lincoln Journal Star. He worked in the bindery department for quite a while and became a tool maker, uh, probably working on the presses and so forth. In 1881, his father joined another firm in Lincoln called Jansen Brothers, which is a furniture store <clears throat> you've never heard of either. And then in 1884, he went for, to work for the Wisconsin Furniture and Coffin Company and they had a huge building down on about 6th and L streets. They also had numerous other uh, businesses in the city of Lincoln, uh, so it was a very good job. They lived at 921 F Street. This would be near Park School, about two blocks away from Park School. The house is no longer there, but all of the houses down there at that time were of a very similar pattern. Uh, they were set on very narrow lots because originally the lots in Lincoln were downtown very narrow because all the lumber had to be brought in uh, initially by wagon loads and then later by trains. But they could only bring in a certain width of lumber and the people that sold the original lots reasoned that the houses would be smaller. Uh, and so it all worked together to bring those little houses down around Park School. The little ones were the original ones. And by that time, Lincoln's population had already reached 40,000. Uh, Charlie then went to work from the journal for a company called Taylor and Landis Printers, uh, which were about 10th and O Streets. Uh, in 1887, one of his biographies shows that he graduated from Lincoln High School. Uh, unfortunately, the graduation statistics for Lincoln High School all around that period, 1869, 70, 71, mentioned no Charlie or Charles Taylor at all. In fact, the only Taylor that graduated was a Georgia Taylor, and I doubt very serious has any relationship at all. He then moved uh, for a few months, for reasons unknown, uh, to Los Angeles. And a lot of these early people moved around with no record whatsoever where they went. But he returned to Lincoln, and the listing in the city directory showed him as a watchmaker and a railroad switchman. So he's beginning to develop other talents. Uh, in 1889, he's listed as a stamp maker. Uh, on South 11th Street, Lincoln's population has reached 55,000. Now, a stamp maker, I think, is like a tool and die maker. Uh, if you look it up, it's a little unclear, but I think that's what it is. Uh, in 1890, he moved to Kearney. Uh, and at Kearney, uh, a much smaller town, a population of about 8,000 at that time, he went into the business of manufacturing metal house numbers. Everybody needs one of those. Now they paint him on the curb. But uh, 1892, uh, he was attending a youth meeting at the Jolly Young Men and Women's Club. Sounds like a good place to go. And there he met his future wife, a young lady by the name of Henrietta Webert. She came from Dayton, Ohio, which becomes key to the whole story in a little bit. In 1894, they married. Uh, they married in the United Brethren Church, and for reasons unclear to me, the man who was the bishop of the United Brethren Church, which I think became part of the Methodist Church a little bit later, if I'm not mistaken, but this Methodist suggested to Charlie that he move to Dayton, Ohio unclear why this would be, uh, except he thought that they would have a better chance at, uh, un at employment, that there would be a better job for him there. So naturally, right away, uh, Henrietta and Charlie picked up and moved to Lincoln, ignoring the man completely. Uh, in fact, the 1895 directory shows him again living at the same address, 921F, which is his father's house. So my thinking is this is probably very, very uh, short term, but he's listed as a machinist in the city directory at that time. Uh, 1896, their son Sam is born, and in fact at that point they do move to Dayton, Ohio. There he worked for a company called the Stoddard Manufacturing Company, which still is in existence. They manufactured, interestingly, sort of a bizarre 
range from farm machinery to bicycle parts. And if you think ahead, you probably can see where the story is going now. Uh, now Henrietta's uncle, his wife's uncle, owned a building which she leased, he leased, excuse me, to a bicycle shop called the Wright Bicycle Company, W-R-I-G-H-T, on West 3rd Street in Dayton. 1898, Charlie decided to start his own machine shop. Uh, and at one point, the Wright brothers came to him. They were developing something they called the coaster brake for a bicycle. And they wanted Charlie to help develop that. Uh, apparently he did, we don't know exactly how that went, but he sold the shop within a year and went to work for the Dayton Electric Company. Uh, and at that time he begins to move up in the world, he's making ten dollars a week. Uh, then in 1901 he goes to work for the Wright Brothers Cycle Shop at eighteen dollars a week, which is a pretty good percentage increase. And what he was doing for them was building a wind tunnel to experiment with gliders. Uh, this may have been the first use of a wind tunnel for anything aeronautical, we're not sure, but it's a pretty good bet. Uh, the Wright brothers, without telling Charlie this, were experimenting with this glider in the hopes of being able to figure out some way to put an engine on it. Big concept. Uh, in 1902, the Wright brothers then sought out an engine to put on this plane. What they needed was a engine which would weigh less than 200 pounds, because of course a glider isn't gonna carry much weight, and will produce eight to nine braking horsepowers. Nobody expressed any interest in building an engine for them, so they asked Charlie to build it from scratch. And using the Wright Brothers tool shop, uh, he developed an, an aluminum cast, water-cooled uh, crankcase with a carbon steel crankcase as well. It developed 12 horsepower, which was more than they needed, uh, and was enough to drive a chain-driven two-propeller aircraft. On December the 3rd of 1903, the Wright brothers tested their first plane, uh, and at that point they flew for 59 seconds, and that was, that was 120 feet, so not a great flight. Uh, I've been on flights that didn't get that far, <laughs> uh, so not so bad. Uh, then in 1908, uh, they had a crash in which Thomas Selfridge, one of their pilots, was uh, killed and Orville was badly injured. Uh, that's also the year in 1908 that the Wright brothers sent an airplane to the Nebraska State Fair here in Lincoln. 1910, they came back to the Nebraska State Fair to demonstrate one of their aircraft, and we've got a lot of pictures of this one. Historical Society can show you several pictures, uh, and you can also see the plane crashing. Uh, this becomes the first airplane crash in the state of Nebraska. Uh, no one was hurt in that one. Uh, in 1911, uh, Charlie goes again to work for the Wright brothers in a different capacity uh, with a man by the name of Galbraith Rogers, and now he's up to $70 a week, so considerably more. And what he's doing is working on the first transcontinental flight. Now the first transcontinental flight took 49 days, so, you know, lots of opportunities in between there for the luggage to get lost. There were several crashes along the way, uh, and what Charlie did was he was on a train that went along and sort of paralleled because very often he would have to repair that engine overnight or that plane, take off and fly a little bit further, he'd get on the train, <laughs> meet him, and repair it again. Uh, 49 days from coast to coast. Uh, in the 1920s, uh, he's sort of semi-retired uh, and buys a whole bunch of land in California. The 1920s was not a good time to buy land in California. He lost everything. Uh, by 1930, he was literally bankrupt and went to work for the North American Aviation Company. Then in 1936, he went to work again in a way for the Wright brothers. He was working for Henry Ford, uh, who was developing a museum uh, called Heritage Village. Now it's part of Greenfield Village, uh, outside of Dayton, and they brought, one of the things that uh, Henry Ford did was he picked up the Wright Cycle Shop from Dayton and moved it to Greenfield Village. So at that point, Charlie was kind of a, a curator, if you will, and he's up to an $800 a year annual stipend, not really a, a salary. During World War I, he went to work in a defense factory. 1945, he had a heart attack. 
uh, which left him unable to work. He became a charity case, uh, literally uh, having no money at all, and the aviation industry got together and provided enough funds for him to be put into private care. 1956, he passed away in California. Uh, along the way, he supposedly had a machine shop in Lincoln and supposedly graduated from Lincoln High. Uh, those two things we can't substantiate. Uh, but we do know the wind tunnel was probably a first of its type. Now we'll see if I can figure this out. That didn't work, John. But that did. Uh, there's Charlie a little bit later in life. Uh, he was noted as being the first aviation mechanic in the United States. He was the first aviation crash inspector in the United States. He was the first aviation airport manager in the United States. And he engineered the first transcontinental flight. Uh, he was known at the time as the third Wright brother. Uh, a man which I would guess if we were to take a poll that most of you would not have heard of, but certainly very influential in, in flight. I figured out that wasn't Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> Eveline Broadstone is a, is a woman which many of you will have heard of, and when I get done you will have heard of her and you will be reminded of it, uh, but a great percentage of you probably know very, very little <coughs> about Eveline. Uh, she was, uh, Eveline, her father, uh, came to Superior, Nebraska with his wife, his son, Louis, and his daughter, Eveline. She'd been born in uh, 1875 in Wisconsin, and there her father, Hans, operated a store and later began publishing a magazine called The Philatelic West, which almost none of you will ever have heard of. It was a stamp collector's magazine, but it morphed into what was known as Hobbies Magazine. Hobbies Magazine was the overwhelming largest hobby magazine in the United States in the 1950s. Covered all bases and it's out of Chicago and extremely well known. Um, Hans, the father, died in 1881 but the father left the family in Superior at that point and Eveline graduated from Superior High School in 1890 and at that point in time she had become friends with a young lady in a nearby village by the name of Willa Cather. She has some interesting friends as well. She attended business college in Burlington, Iowa. Uh, and then in 1895, she answered a want ad in the newspaper, which advertised for a bookkeeper uh, to go to Chicago and work for a company called the Vesti Packing and Cold Storage Company. Uh, this became a very large business in the United States, the Vesti, and her brother ultimately will become involved in that business, but if not the Vesti company, but with the cold storage business. Uh, the headquarters of the Vesti Company was in Liverpool, England. Uh, in England, they were then deciding to move from Liverpool to London, which was a, not a huge distance, but enough that they needed somebody to coordinate this. And they had Eveline come over from the United States, from Chicago, to go to Liverpool to oversee the moving of the Vesti Company's headquarters into the city of London. By 1914, she's only in her 40s, but she decides to retire, interestingly enough, uh, and she purchased an apartment in Superior, Nebraska. But with the coming of World War I, uh, she was sort of inveigled to come back to work for the company because the Vesti Company was involved in supplying meat for their troops, the British troops, and the Allied troops all over Europe. Uh, so she went back to England again, and there she was pressed into service as what they called a corporate troubleshooter, which covered all sorts of bases. And she was also a meat buyer for all over Europe. She traveled all over buying meat for the company. By 43, so just a couple of years later, her annual salary reached $250,000 a year. That made her the highest paid woman executive in the world. Today, that would be we don't know, you can't translate things through the years exactly, but her annual salary would have been something in the margin of $2,500,000 to $400,000 per year. So she became overnight the highest paid woman executive in the world. In the meantime, the man who had owned this Vesti company, uh, who was named Baronet William Vesti, because of his service in World War I, supplying all of the meat to all of the British troops, 
and much of the European front, their meat as well, he was elevated to Lord Vesti. And he was considered at that time the richest man in England and the seventh richest man in the world. Of course, Warren Buffett hadn't been born then. So. In 1924, Eveline married William Vesti. She changed her first name from Eveline to Evelyn uh, and became Lady, Lady Vesti. And they moved to Kingswood, England, which is uh, near Southwark, England, if you know that's part of London. Uh, and they moved into it, and you should Google this, the house they lived in was a castle, a huge castle, which still stands today. Just uh, Google Kingswood, England, and you'll see pictures of this huge castle that they lived in. Uh, just about the same time, uh, Evelyn and Lewis's mother in Superior passed away. Uh, so Lewis and Evelyn came back to the United States and gave the city of Superior what's known as the Broadstone Memorial Hospital in their, in their mother's honor. She died in 1941. Lady Vesti died in 1941. She was buried in Superior at the Evergreen Cemetery on land which her mother had originally sold to the city of Superior for $150. So I hope she got a good deal. Uh, in eight, 1985, uh, the Vesti family was still said to be the richest family in Britain, with the one exception of the royal family. Superior uh, in Knuckles County uh, has some very interesting ties then to the wealthiest woman literally in the world. This is a man by the name of George Francis Train, uh, and he's going to be the man that is sort of responsible for and you can use that word in many different contexts, but uh, the Union Pacific Railroad is kind of going to be his fort. Uh, at the time the Transcontinental Railroad was proposed, uh, it had started clear back in the 1852 when the uh, government was putting out, figuring out how to make land grants. Uh, their idea at that time was that any land grant that they made in, a, in an area, no matter how much land they granted to somebody else, the remaining land would be worth double what the original had been, so that any land gift in large amounts would be revenue neutral. We hear revenue, revenue neutral a lot anymore, and I don't know how it worked out, but the federal government immediately, knowing this to be true as far as they were concerned, they raised the price of land they were selling for a, from a base of $1.25 to $1.250, doubled it in other words. Uh, so. The sheer size of what the Union Pacific was being proposed as a railroad to meet with the Central Pacific someplace in the middle uh, was huge and therefore it was bound to attract a large number of, we'll call them entrepreneurs, to be very kind. And one of the people who was involved immediately was a man by the name of Oakes Ames, O-A-K-E-S, Ames. Uh, he was a railroad promoter and he was the chairman of what had been incorporated by the U.S. Uh, legislature as a railroad, the Union Pacific Company. Uh, unfortunately, it's going to become embroiled in scandal, as we'll see in a few minutes, but Ames, Nebraska is named for Oaks Ames, nonetheless. Uh, another man that was involved at this point in time uh, was John Jackson Kozad, and he was given a grant of $40,000 from the federal government. Uh, no, not $40,000, I'm sorry, 40,000 acres of land in order to encourage him to develop communities along the path. Uh, they wanted him to form colonies, and he did, a couple, and of course, Cozad, Nebraska, bears his name. Uh, and one of his sons uh, is Robert Henry, uh, whose name was Robert Henry Cozad originally, but uh, his mother and he separated themselves from the family. Uh, the Cozads at one point were not exactly well thought of in, in many areas. Uh, he, Mr. Cozad, was probably best known as being a faro player, and whenever he would go to start a town, he worked around Neely, he worked around Cozad, he worked in Illinois, and so forth. But as soon as he ran short, he would, for example, in Nebraska, he would go back to Omaha and start a faro game until he won enough money to come back and complete his project. So he was an interesting man himself. Uh, the most interesting man, however, of course, is George Francis Train. Uh, he was a schemer almost beyond belief. Uh, some of the things he did were so staggeringly large, I guess, that you had, they had to be legal because they just were so huge you could hardly believe them. Uh, at one point in time, 
he owned some land in Omaha, which was called Train Town. And Train Town at that time was literally as large as the city of Omaha. And we'll see where it was in a second. Uh, in the 1860s, the man by the name of Thomas Durant, who was a physician, went to George Francis Train uh, for help in financing the railroad because Train had been financing railroads all over the world. And so Train immediately started trying to sell stock uh, in Boston and the East Coast. But he was unable to get enough interest to make a large goal. And so he decided to employ a French concept which had been developed probably in about 1832, somewhere in that area, uh, called it Credit Foncier. And when it's in French, you know it's probably shady right off the bat, <laughs> except that Credit Foncier is still in existence today as a private company. So either it has transitioned into a more reasonable uh, way of doing business or not, I can't, can't speak to that. Uh, but it, he's going to employ this. It's a method of financing something by using real estate in a leveraged position. Sounds like something maybe a president of the United States might be involved in at some time. Uh, he also used the Credit Mobilier, which was kind of a wholly owned business, which was parallel to the Credit Foncier. Uh, now, in order to get started, he needed a corporation. So he went back to Pennsylvania, and he found a corporation which was in business, which was not the least bit involved with railroads. But he paid $25,000 to buy that company. Now, the company really didn't even need to exist. All he wanted was the name. And this is sort of what happened with Berkshire Hathaway when Warren Buffett bought it. He kept the name. So what Mr. Train did is he bought for $25,000 this shell of a corporation. Then in Pennsylvania, he was able to, for $50, change the name of that corporation so that it became the Credit Foncier. Then what he did was he began selling bonds on the Credit Foncier. He took the money from the bonds and paid the $25,000 that he had used to buy the corporation. So at this point, he is out $50, <coughs> but he immediately starts selling more stock. And in fact, Oaks Ames puts up $200,000 worth of stock. Uh, and before you know it, the wheels of financing are beginning to take, take shape and, and pick up, as it were, steam. Uh, then he went to the U.S. Congress, and he asked them to issue U.S. bonds in the amount of $100 million, which was a lot of money back then, uh, $100 million, uh, and to grant 20 million acres of land in the furtherance of the Union Pacific Railroad. Then in 1863, uh, in the winter, November of 1863, train came to Omaha. And with him, he brought his wife and her French maid uh, and his cousin, who was a man by the name of George Bemis. Now, George Bemis, it's intriguing to think that he might have uh, been the Bemis Bag Company, but he wasn't. And so the Bemis Bag Company and the Bemis Building in Omaha, which is now an art museum, not related at all, as far as I can determine. But George Bemis was his personal secretary, George Francis Train's personal secretary. Um, and they stayed at the Herndon House Hotel, which was probably the major hotel at that point in Omaha's history. And at one point, they're eating dinner in the dining room, and a tremendous wind comes up. And George Francis Train, who was never known to be bashful, asks one of the waiters to go and stand with his back to the window in case the wind would blow the glass out. Uh, the manager of the hotel was <laughs> just unbelievingly irritated and blew up at Train. And Train himself was just, well, you know, what have I done sort of thing. Uh, and he said, I will build a hotel across the street and wipe you out of business. I will build a hotel bigger and better, and I will build it in less than 60 days. Now, this is the way he talked. And yet, that's exactly what he did. He built the hotel, which was uh, known at that time as the Cousins or Cozens, C-O-Z-Z-E-N-S Hotel, in about 60 days, across from the Herndon House, House Hotel, drove the Herndon House Hotel out of business, train gets the Herndon House Hotel, and sells it to the Union Pacific Railroad for their headquarters. <laughs> so you can see how he continually is moving things. Uh, 
Uh, on December the 2nd of 1863, the Union Pacific breaks ground in Nebraska on the Nebraska side, not where Abraham Lincoln has caused the terminus to be on the Council Bluff side, uh, near the ferry landing on the Missouri River, which is called the Lone Tree Ferry. And it's probably not very far away from where uh, the river would come up towards the uh, Union Pacific Depot today, just kind of in that general area, think of it. Uh, on hand uh, was the territorial governor of Nebraska, uh, Governor Saunders, uh, the mayor of New York City for unclear reasons, all sorts of famous dignitaries and including the then 34-year-old George Francis Train who dressed in white from head to toe, completely dressed in white. So he did stand out a little bit. Uh, and they had speeches, of course, and those speeches were punctuated between each speech with cannon fire from Council Bluffs. It was a big event. Uh, and he spoke extemporaneously for nearly an hour uh, and talked about what he called the garden which would flow all the way from the East Coast through Nebraska to the West Coast. And he called uh, Nebraska, he called it a highway of magnificent cities uh, and a garden strip through the state of Nebraska. Uh, two years later, he will, in Omaha, buy from the Kuntz brothers, and they were bankers, financiers in Omaha very early. Uh, he bought from them a 500-acre tract of land, uh, which the best way to put it in your mind is to think of where Lawrence and Gardens is, and if you can think of Lawrence and Gardens, it ran roughly from Lawrence and Gardens, so approximately from the interstate, to downtown Omaha from the Missouri River to 20th Street, a nice little chunk of land right there. And this becomes train town. Uh, he then divides part of it up. He divides 80 acres of it, uh, about 20 square blocks, into land. And he then plats that part of it as the Credit Foncier Edition. Then <laughs> he goes <laughs> to Chicago and he purchases what we would call today prefabricated houses. All of the wood cut up, all of the bricks even, for 20 houses in Chicago, puts them on trains, brings them to Omaha, puts them together as houses. They cost him $1,200 each. Then he sells those houses to who? Credit Foncier, okay? Then the Credit Foncier didn't sell the houses. They rented the houses for $60 a month. Then the rest of the land that wasn't developed as that part of the addition was sold for $250 an acre, which was a good deal more than he had paid for it, of course. Um, unfortunately, there was 420 acres of this plot. It was never platted, uh, and he hadn't paid the Kuntz brothers for them. Uh, he just hadn't probably printed up new stock or something like that. Uh, so the Kuntz brothers foreclosed on that property, uh, and although train fought uh, the action, he was unable to win primarily because he was in prison in New York. <laughs> now, train will later even run for the presidency of the United States, but he has a few shadows over his, uh, his, his uh, reputation. Um, then he sets up the Credit Mobilier, which as I said is a wholly owned corporation. He doesn't sell stock in that, and that's going to sell this construction supplies to the Union Pacific Railroad. So the first thing he does is he buys a company called the H.M. Hoxie Company in 1865, uh, and they are paid with stock printed on the Credit Foncier. So again, you know, he's created money out of nothing and is paying that off. Um, unfortunately, at this point in time, uh, it becomes, re it is revealed uh, that a lot of the stock uh, in the two corporations had been given away free to the members of Congress, which we would probably think of today as strictly as payola, but it was in order to get, obviously, deals and other things out of the Congress. And you'd think at this time, this is all land on Mr. Train's head, but Mr. Train has cleverly made Oaks Ames the chairman of the corporation, so Oaks Ames <laughs> ends up in jail. George Francis Train uh, continues on his merry way. But all this financing begins to unravel a little bit. Uh, and George Bemis then sues. This is George Bemis, not the paper magnet. He sues Train for 47,000 odd dollars in what he calls unpaid wages. 
Remember, this is his cousin who has sued him. Uh, but the suit is settled in Bemis's favor, not in George Francis Trains. And so what they did was they sold all of the remaining assets in Omaha of the Credit Foncier to satisfy the judgment by Trains' cousin. Bemis stayed in Omaha. He became the mayor of the city of Omaha in 1882 and served through 1896. So it worked well for him. Uh, George Francis Train obviously had a few shortcomings uh, as a man, but he did move the Union Pacific from a paper concept into an actual physical completed transcontinental railroad. Now you also remember that the transcontinental railroad is moving from Omaha towards the west and at the same time the Central Pacific Railroad is moving towards it from the west coast. And remember, they are paid $16,000 an acre plus land grants for every mile they constructed. At first, about a mile or two a day. But as they began to get rolling, they were able to make about five miles a day. So one, two, three, four, five miles a day. But when they get to the foothills of the Rocky Mountains, the $16,000 goes to $32,000. And when I get to the Rocky Mountains, the $32,000 becomes $48,000. So you can see here that there is a definite advantage to them to keep building. So we find these two railroads do it, and certainly there must have been collusion. We can't say it was all George Francis train. But as they start to approach, they do this. And they move so that they actually have both moved beyond the central point until finally the federal government says, well, wait a minute, <laughs> you know, you need to bring this together. That's the idea. And so we have at Promontory, Utah, uh, the Golden Spike ultimately uh, laying. Um, when George Francis Train died, uh, one of his friends spoke at the eulogy and said, there is no doubt that he was extremely eccentric to some mentally, to some degree, mentally unbalanced. Nevertheless, he was a wonderful man. Okay, yeah. I have no picture of the next gentleman we want to talk about, so just look at George Francis Train and think of what you might do uh, to create money out of nowhere. This man created money in large measure, but not out of nowhere. His name was William Scully, S-C-U-L-L-Y. Uh, and here again, only a few of you will ever have heard of William Scully. He was born in Ireland in 1812. He came to the United States in 1850, and he settled in Illinois. And he noticed something. Uh, at that time, the preemption land laws said that there was no limit to the amount of land uh, that an individual could purchase. So in order to maximize uh, the average dollar uh, that they could get, uh, or that he would pay, in other words, to pay the lowest possible price, uh, he tried to stay out of the $2.50 land from the railroads and wanted to go back to the federally owned land that was roughly half of that. Uh, also, he discovered that he could buy a college scrip, an agriculture land scrip for 50 cents on it or 60 cents on the dollar. So he was able to keep lowering the amount of money he was going to have to pay per acre. And using these devices by buying up federal land and using scrip, uh, he started buying land in Nebraska, Illinois, Kansas, and Missouri. And what he did was he would go out and personally inspect the land before he bought it so that he knew what he was getting. And he tried to find very rich agricultural land. And basically, the land he's going to buy that we're going to talk about now, he paid $1.25 an acre for, some of it considerably less. Uh, and in fact, in one day uh, in 1870, on June the 13th, uh, he went to the Beatrice, Nebraska land office and bought 30,000 acres of land just in one fell swoop, paying $38,084 for that land. Two days later, he bought another 6,400 acres of land, all of the land left in Knuckles County. He bought all of it. Scully did not farm this land. What he did was he leased it to tenants. And in so doing, he put a few codicils on it. They had to do all the repairs on the land. They had to pay all the taxes on the land, make any payments on the land to him, 
and they had to guarantee that they would put at least 20% of the land in alfalfa. Now, this sounds a little peculiar, but as alfalfa was coming into its own in Nebraska, one of the things we know about it was that if it wasn't planted in some other crop, alfalfa was really good because it's a nitrogen fixer. So in off fallow years, it was fixing nitrogen, and it has a great root structure, so it wasn't going to lose that land to erosion or other means. Then each tract of land, he didn't work, he didn't, make, he didn't watch over it. Uh, he hired an agent, for example, in Nichols County, he hired a man by the name of Mr. Fulmer, uh, and in, in that county, the county officers railed against Mr. Fulmer uh, because they said it was, what was happening here was the same thing that had happened in Ireland, uh, that too much land was ending up in the hands of individuals, and that's where he got the title Lord Scully. Not because he ever really had the title, uh, but because they were sort of making a slur against his lordly actions in the United States. Um, and by the 1880s, we have in Lincoln the Irish Land League and a couple of other Irish entities headquartered in Lincoln, which are fighting British rule in Ireland and Irish land ownership. Um, and in fact, the Nebraska State Journal, again later to become the Lincoln Journal, editorialized that there is a tendency among foreign capitalists to hold large sections of land, Nebraska land, which has proven to be such a curse in Ireland. Well, they're certainly right. However, uh, they're going to take this case to the Supreme Court and ask them to make this not legal. So the Supreme Court in 1887 passed what they call the Alien Land Act. Uh, basically, it says that you have to be a U.S. citizen to purchase land. But they didn't made it, make it re retroactive, so he had all his land as a great. What did Scully do? He applied to become a U.S. citizen, and he became a naturalized U.S. citizen at that point. Um, by 1906, in Nebraska, he owned about 60,000 acres of land, which seems like a lot of land, but on the other hand, it's not a huge amount of land, but that's only in Nebraska. But he was, at that point in time, one of the largest individual landholders in the entire United States but he's based in Nebraska. Uh, what he started doing at that point in time was he started transferring all of his land and wealth to his wife. He died in 1906, and she died in 1932. Now, in the meantime, over in Iowa we had Parsons College. This is kind of a parallel story, which is originally a Presbyterian college, but it became a private institution, a for-profit institution, if you will. Uh, now, the grandson of Lord Scully, now living in Nebraska, William Scully, was a promoter for one of the offshoots of per Parsons College called Pershing College in Beatrice. Uh, and it was through his efforts that Pershing College started. Uh, however, as enrollments began to slide after an initial period of really good results, um, he decided First of all, he was going to redeem the school, so he purchased $500,000 worth of the mortgage on the school that was held uh, by Banker's Life Insurance Company uh, in Lincoln to help keep the school going. But it was on pretty shaky grounds, and in fact, the people in Beatrice were astounded, dumbfounded to hear uh, on January the 29th of 1971, David Brinkley announced nationally, what they didn't know locally, was that the college was going to close, uh, and the following day, everything, the students had to be gone, everything had to be gone by noon the following day. So Pershing, go out of business. So in 1972, Scully then forecloses on the school, which now owe him a lot of money as well. Uh, they owe him a million too. Uh, and two years later, he will take this school that he has, if you will, purchased, and he'll give it to the University of Nebraska. Uh, and in the meantime, Hiram Scott University, which is uh, the, another offshoot, Parsons, uh, it closed in 1971. John F. Kennedy closed in 1975. Uh, and in 1973, not only did Parsons College close, but they leveled it. It's just completely gone. Today we'd have some of those same questions uh, about foreign corporate ownership. Uh, now Ted Turner is the largest individual landholder in Nebraska, and he owns over 375,000 acres of land, last count, and still buying. However, 
Not one acre of it did he get for $1.25 an acre. <laughs> Finally, a new face. <laughs> uh, a very famous man, and I can almost guarantee you that none of you have ever heard of Fred Niblo. Sounds like maybe he invented canned corn or something, but that's, that's Fred Niblets. Uh, no relation. Uh, the story starts with a man by the name of F. W. Leidke, or Leidke, L-I-E-D-K-E, -E, uh, who had been in the Civil War and wounded in Gettysburg and came to Nebraska in 1871 uh, and settled near York, Nebraska. Uh, he then had three other people came with him at the same time. They bought a full section of land or acquired a full section of land. And in order to prove it up, they had to each build a cabin, for example, uh, so what they did was where these four tracks came together in the section, they built four very close together sod houses and right dead in the middle they dug a well. So literally they created uh, four, technically they created four harmsteads, homesteads, able to do it. Um, Mr. Leidke or Lidke then sent for his wife, Anna Duberger, obviously a French lady and woman of culture who with their son came to join him in 1873, and he was elected in that year the York County Clerk. Uh, the family moved into the city of York at that time and built what was probably the first frame dwelling built in the city of York, uh, 8th and Platte or 8th and Lincoln Avenue. Um, on January 1, their son Frederick was born. He's the man we're going to look at for a minute. January 1, 1874, uh, and at that time his father Leadkey was elected as a county judge. Population of York at that time was about 2,000, and Nebraska was all suffering under drought and a grasshopper infestation. So land prices were de uh, depressed considerably. Uh, and as young Fred became a young boy, his father became the state auditor in 1878. This was a big job, the state auditor at that point in time. Uh, with the 20th century, though, Fred Wanderlust begins to travel. And as he travels, he became many things. He was an actor, a writer, and often he turned to himself as an explorer. Uh, it was also at that point in time, he became what is, and we'll put it in quotes, a black face monologist, monologist, monologist. I don't know how that word fits together, but at any rate, he was a sort of a comedian, if you will, at that point in time. And he was working in vaudeville in New York City. Uh, one of the venues he worked at most often was called Niblo's, N-I-B-L-O apostrophe S, garden. And this is a garden like Winter Garden or Madison Square Garden. Not truly a garden, but more like a uh, theater, if you will. Uh, and William Niblo was the owner of that business. Uh, and he had started as a coffee house owner uh, and later a caterer and he bought uh, a circus grounds which he landscaped so there was a little bit of a garden to it uh, and it became known as most popularly as the site where uh, in 1835 uh, Barnum had started his first circus uh, but he turned it away from circuses into drama and at that point in time Frederick from York changes his name from Fred Leadkey, because nobody could spell it anyway, uh, and he changed his name to Fred Niblo, named it after Niblo's garden. Uh, and at one point in time, we see him listed on a handbill, he's calling himself as Frederico Nobile, okay, still Fred Niblo. Now, during the vaudeville days, known as Fred Niblo, he met a young lady by the name of Josephine Cohan, and she was the sister of George M. Cohan. So he's going to marry in 1901, she'll become his wife. And they started traveling around the world, and one of the things they did uh, was travel extensively in Africa. And while he was there, he began taking motion pictures of Africa. Probably, well, as near as we can tell, the first motion pictures ever taken uh, of Africa. And when he came home, he put together lecture circuits around them. Uh, and he then started being interested in not just movies, uh, but in movies that he would write the script for, as well as the travel lectures and monologues that he delivered. Uh, then he joined his brother-in-law, Sam Harris, uh, which will, a name which will mean nothing to you unless you're into theatrics, theatricals, uh, and they started together a theatrical company. 
uh, jo uh, Josephine died in 1916, his first wife, uh, at a time which he joins INCE, I-N-C-E, studios, and he becomes the producer and director of silent films. Uh, and in Australia, he developed his first and produced his first silent film, uh, sometimes called The Marriage Ring. It didn't stand the test of time. Uh, but at that point in time, his wife had passed away, and he meets another starlet uh, by the name of Enid Bennett, which if you're interested in films, you would probably recognize her name. Uh, he marries her a few months later. His first film that he will produce and direct, which you probably will have heard of, was called The Mark of Zorro. Uh, it starred Douglas Fairbanks Banks, and was released in 1920. Um, he then founded and became the first director of and vice president of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. We know that today as the organization which awards the Oscars. So he became the starter of that, if you will. Uh, he directed The Three Musketeers and Ben-Hur, and at this point in time, his career was probably at a peak. But unfortunately, his career, like many of the silent film careers, didn't translate well into the talking movies, if you will. Uh, he tried acting again in 1930, uh, and he retired in 1933. He had directed 44 films, acted in 10, produced three, and had written from scratch an additional two. Uh, he had a son, which became a, free uh, a movie writer. Uh, he died in 1949, uh, and his home in Los Angeles, which was a semi-circle somehow, uh, is now the estate of our old friend Rupert Murdoch. So his house lives on. Uh, he has a star on Hollywood Boulevard. Uh, he directed through his career uh, such films that are movie stars you have heard of as Douglas Fairbanks, Lillian Gish, Ronald Coleman, Greta Garbo, Norma Talmadge, Rudolph Valentino, Buster Keaton, Joan Crawford, and Cary Grant. He is very well known in Hollywood, but Probably you've never heard of him. One of my favorite guys, this guy's name is Gurdon Waddles, G-U-R-D-O-N, Waddles, W-A-T-T-L-E-S. What a tremendous disadvantage in junior high school that would be <laughs> to have a name of Gurdon Waddles. Uh, the family name was originally Mac Waddles when they came from Scotland. Uh, Gurdon, as we see him here, was born in New York in 1855, moved to Carroll County, Iowa. Uh, he went to Iowa State University. Uh, the first year, his family was far anything but wealthy. Uh, he had $20 to last him through the entire year. Uh, he bought a $5 suit by the end of the year and a 25-cent comb, and his biography says that he was continually drugged down by the fact that he had spent 25 cents for this comb. It just bothered him forever. Uh, when he graduated, he started teaching school at $35 a month, and he became ultimately the superintendent of schools in Carroll, Iowa. Uh, this didn't work out too well. He ran for a county office, lost, and then went to law school. Admitted to the Iowa Bar, began practicing in 1882, incorporated the Farmers Bank of Carroll, later the Rochester Loan Bank in New Hampshire, which became and still is one of the largest financial institutions on the East Coast, and I've never heard of it. Um, he established the first national bank then of Carroll, uh, and within four years owned 16 banks in Iowa. Uh, in 1892, only 36 years old, uh, he comes to Omaha as the president of the Omaha Union National Bank. Uh, and in order to finance that, he sold several of his banks in Iowa, and he began buying stock in Omaha of the Omaha Street Railway Company at $30 a share, which he admitted later was the biggest mistake he had ever made in his life. It didn't work out. Uh, he said, I should have just bought cheap property in downtown Omaha. It would have been a lot better. His ideal was a strong one, though. And his idea was that he would buy stock in these street railway companies, which would move people away from downtown, enable them to buy properties, which he would own the real estate for, and it would force people to develop away from the city and it would populate him and a demand for the land. But the whole concept didn't work as well as he hoped it would. Uh, he says that decision was erroneous. He uh, did, however, become very important in streetcar business at that time. He was involved in the, the uh, huge riots in 1909 and so forth. Uh, but during the same period of time, forget the street railroads, it didn't work out for him. Uh, but he noticed 
that there was a need for a hotel. Uh, one of the things he did immediately, however, was he ordered an architect uh, to design a house for him at 320 South 37th Street. It cost $15,000, which would be today probably a million five, two million dollars, something like that. Uh, and although the Port Crochet was taken away in 1955, it still exists as a home in the city of Omaha. Uh, then in 1895, which was the heels of the 1893 Depression, uh, a man named William Jennings Bryan had, con had looked at the Chicago World's Fair and dreamed of a World's Fair for Nebraska. Uh, he went to Gurdon Waddles, uh, who was at that time president of the Omaha Commercial Club, uh, the Chamber of Commerce, if you will, by another name. And they together proposed something called the Trans-Mississippi Exposition and International Congress of American Indians. It became a World's Fair. Uh, he took over, started traveling around and financing this World's Fair, uh, which was extremely successful. And at the end, they sold 2.5 million tickets uh, to the fair in one year, 300,000 tickets in one week, 100,000 tickets in one day the day that President McKinley visited. And the original investors of this proposition, who originally thought this was a donation, got back 90% of their investment, which was unheard of at that time. Uh, he established the Omaha Grain Exchange. Uh, then, in 1905, he bought 90 acres of land in California. Now, it doesn't sound like a whole lot, 90 acres of land. And he built a home there which he called Walita, J-U-A-L-I-T-A, Walita. It was going to be just a summer house. This house and this 90 acres today is known as Hollywood. <laughs> so, made a bunch of money. Um, in Nebraska, he became the king of Exarban uh, and so forth. Uh, then in 1913, seeing that there was a need for that hotel I mentioned earlier, he convinced Arthur Brandeis to give lots at 18th and Douglas. They then commissioned Thomas R. Kimball to design the Fontenelle Hotel. So when he died in 1932, his home, the mansion, was purchased by the city of Los Angeles and is today operated as a museum. Okay, there's six of the people of the 20-some that I was ready to talk about today and the 150 that John charged me to talk about. <laughs> So we're going to have to make tracks before the end of the year. You can see that. Uh, we've come pretty close to the time to the end of our hour, but I will ask if there are any questions. There, nobody raised their hand during the program, as far as I know. Uh, and we can take questions on beyond the hour, but if you have any questions, I'd be glad to attempt to answer them. If not, I thank you very much. And John uh, mentioned there are little program sheets up there that tell you about the next brown bag luncheons from the State Historical Society. And we will work again on 150 people. I'd, I'm curious, how many of you have heard of most of those people that I talked about? <laughs> Some of them, but not all of them. Okay. Did you bring any of that money back? I thought I understood that she couldn't bring any money back from England. Oh, the question was, did she bring any of that? And you're talking now about uh, Lady Vesti. Yeah. She certainly did. Now, how she did that, I don't know. Uh, and I'm not sure what the legality was at that time. Today, it is possible. Uh, you have to have corporations set up and so forth, but she did bring a lot of it back. And they still have uh, uh, every year, um, I think they call it Lady, Lady Vesti Days. Uh, and so she's well remembered there. There is a museum, uh, and I'm not sure what it entails, but it's mostly stuff of hers, as far as I know. Truly, truly amazing lady. Yeah, <laughs>